running the, okay, there we go. Um, and so we have a really nice document to share with you on data routines um, if you're still in the classroom. And, and I think it'll be a nice printable for you to have around when you're, you're developing routines. Then we're gonna talk about different options for supporting um, tutors, I mean, students on tier one assignments using assessments. And then we're gonna talk a little, we're gonna do a little mini analysis of a data report. And if you don't have your own data report, I have a link of a, um, a sample one that you can look at if, um, to do an analysis on your own if you don't have your own data report. So let's dive right into what is differentiation. So um, differentiation is adapting content, process, or product according to a specific student's readiness, interest, and learning profile. And uh, we all know as educators how important this, this has become more and more um, as, the, each, as our culture moves further and further into the variety of um, people in America, the variety of languages in America, and, their, and, and the variety, difference between inner city and urban schools and such. So um, share in the chat, I'll give you a minute to think about it. Why is differentiation critical to any successful classroom? Yes, true, Al. Student population is heterogeneous. True, very true. Nicely put, Sean. <laughs> different humans have different needs. That's that's saying it nice and nice and succinct. So true. And we all learn different ways. Um, I was looking at this um, question today and thinking about it, and I Googled it, and I came came up with a um, a really nice um, def definition for this that includes all the thoughts that you've just posted there. Um, this was the website that I found it from an education website, but it, they stated there that um, differentiation. Differentiated instruction recognizes a diverse student population, various learning styles, and a unique experience, you, how unique experiences influence how individual students respond to teaching. It provides an inclusive environment by using various teaching styles, allowing students to learn in a way that works best for them. Well said, but that is a, a lot for teachers to take in on a regular basis. So at assessments, we like to show you how the data can help you meet all those different needs in different ways and how our content library can also help you in that way. And we're going to um, introduce you to those areas tonight. And if you are a classroom teacher, you'll, you can then explore more on that. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, key data points in assessments assignment report. Um, so, um, this is often something that we call our secret sauce, the data. Um, I, as I said before, I go way back with using assessments. And I have to tell you, once I started teaching with assessments, I didn't know how I taught without the data on a regular basis because it allows you to see your students on every level on a regular basis and know where everybody is. So there's nobody ever slipping through the cracks or pretending they get it when they don't. So the assessments assignment report, it allows you to determine student needs and plan just in time support at each level. So for the whole class, subgroups and individuals. And we say analyzing data early and often as you integrate assessments will boost student engagement and help you make the most of the tool. So that's one thing I'd like to reiterate on is that I used to tell my students we were in training at the start of the school year and I taught sixth, seventh and eighth grade, but I used assessments at all levels. Um, because if you don't use the assessments regularly and share the reports with them and show them how the data helps you plan to teach them better, then they don't understand the purpose of it and they don't take it seriously. But if you model it and teach the tool and share it with them well, they begin to understand the data and how important it is. And it starts to inform their own learning besides it informing your instruction. 
So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just give you a little bit of a live tour of the data report. Um, all of the slides, oh, and I forgot to share that with you. Well, that wasn't very smart of me. There is a slide deck for all of you. I'm gonna get, get the copy right now and drop that into the chat. And uh, we actually are gonna use one of the slides on this today. But everything that I am about to show you is on this slide deck and that's your copy. So you don't have to worry about taking notes if you're new to this or you don't know it. So I'd like to start with how you sign in to even see the assignment report. And there's two ways that you can do it. You can actually do it from assessments and I'm gonna switch screens here because I have to go to my demo screen. You can actually do it from assessments under my assignments. And when you click on that, everything you've ever assigned is here. And if you have more than one Google Classroom, you can, you can separate it that way. You can separate it by status. You can filter it out by date. Um, this is a, a demo Google Classroom. So there's a million different Google Classrooms in here, um, assignments in here. Um, but yours obviously would only have as many Google Classrooms as you have or Canvas Classrooms or whatever LMS you use. Um, you can also sign in, and this is the easiest way, is to sign in from your LMS. If I were to go to my Google Classroom Classworks and I'm like, oh, I wanna look at this assignment. If I click on that assignment, um, it's supposed to bring me to that, but people have deleted stuff to clean this up. So let me try this again. And I can show you another one if that one's not gonna work. Students will see this once the work is added. So somebody has deleted that. So I apologize. I'm gonna still show you, huh. That's really funny, everything's been deleted from here. No worries, I have, an, I have it on another slide thing where I can show it to you. So let me go to my slide deck and I just have to find my link. I wasn't prepared for that, I go to that all the time and that one's always there, so I don't know what's going on. Sometimes it's because they're running an update or something and they don't tell me. That's all the things I'm gonna show you. Here we go. Bear with me for a moment. Hmm, I can't find it. I do apologize. Mm hmm Oh. Okay, sorry that took so long. Um, so this is not a live report. This is a PDF of the report. Um, and if you have a live report, I encourage you to look at your own afterwards, but I just wanted to go over the pieces of it here. Um, so on this report, you can see um, how many students have started, how many are in progress, how many have completed. You can also see the students by um, how they, what they've accomplished um, by each problem in this assignment. You can also see um, what's correct, what's correct eventually. And in a live report, I can hover over this and it will tell you how many, the number of students. And then you can see the detail of the whole assignment going through all of here. You can see each detail. So I'm gonna go back to the slide deck so I can show you the details since I don't have a live report working for me here. I apologize. And I will show you from the slide deck um, exactly what is on each one and it's labeled there for you to look back at. So I was all set to give you a live report and that didn't work out very well, did it? All right, so we're gonna start from, I showed you how to sign in, we're gonna start from here. So across the top, of course, this is a landing page when you open up an assignment. Um, and across the top here is the title of the assignment. They call these student progress cards and you can actually click on them to see the students' names of who's completed what. Um, this, this can be filtered in different ways. That's why it looks different here than it did. And th there's a filter that shows it to you different ways. But again, 
it shows you on this assignment how many got it correct, correct eventually and wrong. But down here, you have the detailed information. So we have common wrong answer. So this one has a common wrong answer. We have student details. You can click on the student and see a detailed report, which I will show you in a couple of slides of just that student. Um, we also have score symbols right here. If you click on this, it tells you what these symbols mean. But I'm gonna tell you that green obviously means correct. And the orange we really like because it means correct eventually, which means that your student persevered, which is wonderful. Um, and red means that they had to finally ask for the answer. And in assessments, you have to ask for the answer to move on if you don't get the right answer. So this student um, asked, got it wrong three times and then got the, and asked for the answer and moved on. So the scoring key tells you what all the X's and the little things mean. The difference is they got it wrong or they asked for hints because all of our practice work has embedded hints in it. Um, you also can um, click open each one of these problems and see how what the problem was, what the right answer was, and then scroll down and see how much, what each one of your students answered, which is really helpful when you have a common wrong answer, because you'd wanna look and see, why did so many of my students get this one wrong? So I have that on the next screen to show you. So here's the common wrong answer. So right here on this problem, you'd probably wanna look at it because what this says is of the students that got it wrong, 33% uh, of them said the answer was nine. And so that would be something that you'd say to the students, huh, I wonder why so many of you got the same wrong answer. And that opens up a great discussion. Even the kids who got it right are engaged in that discussion. Um, this is the whole class average. And this is the individual score for each student. Going across here, you can actually click on this and open it up to see what student um, this student did. They got it wrong twice, then they asked for a hint, and then they got it right correct. They got it correct even though they got zero credit for it. And we don't look at those numbers as a grade. We look at them as data and telling us how we're doing and how we're doing with the learning. Um, and it's really important to help students understand that so they don't say, oh, well, I got it right and I still got it zero for it because it, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't translate to that. Okay, and moving on. Um, this is the student details report. This is the teacher view. As I said to you, if you click on the student name in that report, this will open up. And you would not do this for every one of your students, um, but what it does is it shows you um, how much time a student spent on things. If they spent some time thinking about it, um, when they answered it incorrectly, did they spend some more time thinking about it? Did they think about the hint when they asked for the hint? Um, and it shows you if a student's really been putting a lot of effort in and they're struggling, or is the student just clicking through and asking for the answers and not caring about what they're doing. And what's really valuable about this is because besides when you're training kids to use assessments, besides the fact that you can see exactly what your student did, um, once students realize that you can see exactly what they did, if they're just clicking through and asking for the answers and not putting effort in, once they realize that you can see this, they stop doing that. So usually early on when I'm training students that are new at assessments, I get a screenshot of one of these reports without a student's name showing on it and show them what I can see. So they understand that, you know, they just keep asking for the answer and they're not really doing the math. Um, you can also view your report by standards. And so up here is the standards. This is, it's a tab up here that says, show it to me by standards versus show it to me by problems. And when you show it to you by standards, what this does is it shows you the standard that was on that assignment. There was two problems with that standard. There was four problems with that standard and one problem with that standard. So when you go down here and you look at the average, this 50% means that this student, that's the average for the two problems on that standard. So that's how they did on that standard, but it's the average of two problems. This one, obviously the student's struggling with because the average was zero for four problems on that particular standard. So this is really nice, especially if you do standard-based grading because it gives you a really clear picture of where your students are with the standards and what standards they need more focus on. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit more about these key data points that we just looked at here. And um, what I wanted to show you was is that um, these points are great starting points if you're new to assessments. So the class average, the problem or standard average, the individual student score and the common wrong answer. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview on this. So the class average, and you'll get into a, a, a routine protocol of how you look at reports quickly, the more you get used to them. 
But the class average is a way to quickly assess the whole class understanding on an assignment. If you teach something brand new and the class average is 20% on a practice problem set they did or something they did for you, you know they're at the beginning of learning and they need a lot more practice. So you're gonna, you're not, you're not gonna say, oh, we did really bad on that. You're gonna say, oh, this tells me that we need to do a lot more practice on this. Since it's new, we wouldn't expect to have scored that high. Let's talk about what we didn't understand yesterday and see if we can do better today. Um, the problem or standard average helps you identify the individual problem and or standards that needs the whole class review. And the individual student scores is a place where you could do a one-to-one -one check in with students, individual students to discuss their score and reteach as needed. Sometimes there's a small subgroup of students that fall into that category. And you know, while the rest of them are doing regular practice today on that new skill, you might need to take a small group aside and reteach them. And then the common wrong answer facilitates a whole class discussion around common misconceptions. It is such a great math discussion starter because when you say, hmm, I wonder why so many people got the same wrong answer, I'm going to give you five minutes to see if you can figure it out. Maybe with your partner, maybe you're going to look at your own work. Even your student that got 100% on that one is curious as to why so many of them did it. And they all get really engaged in talking about what their thinking was and how they arrived at that. And, and it, it makes them feel not alone in their struggle because they start to realize we're all in the same struggle, this productive struggle of learning. And everybody's doing the same thing. They're all thinking the same way as we go along. It's a very powerful thing for students to start to feel like they belong in this learning process and they're not sitting there alone thinking I'm the only one that got that wrong, which is the way they would feel if you corrected the papers by hand and handed it to them because they wouldn't know what everybody else did. So um, this is our assignment report protocol. This is like a getting started when you're getting used to it. So the first thing you'd wanna do is review the whole class average. Then you'd wanna review the problem average scores to see if any particular problems had, had uh, common wrong answers or anything that you needed to address. Um, and then you'd want to analyze the common wrong answer and the trends uh, to talk about. Now, once you've done this, you already know in your head what the students need to be retaught, why they had this common wrong answer. But what you don't want to do is go into the class, put the report up and say to them, I can see what everybody did wrong because that's you still leading the lesson. Instead, you say, oh, a lot of us struggled with this one. Does anybody want to share, you know, what, where they where they got with that? Because I'm curious. I'm trying to understand how I can help you learn this better. And you take the onus on you of this information tells me that I'm going to teach you, but you're going to engage them in helping you understand it, even though you almost always understand what they did wrong because you're a teacher. They don't Barbara, know that. Yes. Say that statement one more time. I'm going Rather to. Rather than you as the teacher saying, I understand what everybody did wrong. Right. Say that statement again, because I have a tendency of talking yeah, you, at them instead of discussing with right, them. Right, and it's so easy to look at this report and go, oh, everybody got that common wrong answer. I know exactly what they did wrong. And it's so easy to go into class and because we're with time, you want to go in and say, okay, everybody got number six, got the same wrong answer in number six, and I'm going to tell you why. Instead of telling them why, you say to them, hmm, look at how many of you got the same wrong answer in number six. Can anybody share? what their thinking was with that. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to look at your work and talk with your partner and think about it and not lead the discussion because once you get them to start talking about it, then they become engaged in uh, what the data is showing. And, you're, and I say to them, I can see I need to clarify and teach this a little bit more. If you could share my, your thinking with me, I know better what I need to do for you. So I take the onus on as the teacher of this data tells me I need to do more for you. Help me understand what it is I need to do for you. And it really, really engages students. There's this, this changeover that happens to kids, not overnight. It takes a, consistently using this at least three times a week for, I'd say, six weeks. And you modeling that data for students to start to see, oh, Everybody else is also struggling with the same things. And this helps my teacher know what I need to know because they're not raising their hand and saying, could you explain that again? But when you present it that way, they're, a, they're saying, can you explain that again to you? But they don't realize they're saying that. So does that make sense? Is that clear? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a, it's a real turning point in the classroom. And I think the biggest thing um, for students to see then the data report is that they're not alone in the productive struggle of learning mathematics. Because think about it, if they're only getting papers back from you, 
unless they talk to their friends, they don't know that they're the only one that they don't know. They think I'm the only one that got these, these ones wrong. And they feel frustrated instead of saying, Oh, Oh, everybody else is also struggling with that. And that's okay. Cause we're all learning right now. And that's part of the process of learning. So um, it's powerful. As you can see, I'm a big believer in this. I started every day with the assignment report up, whether it was an exit ticket we did yesterday or a couple of problems we did for homework. But I started it every single day. That was the do now. They came in, they analyzed the report, and I let those students tell me, what should, which ones should we talk about? Now, I already know which ones I want to talk about, but I let them lead it. I don't say, oh, I know we should talk about number four. I say, which ones do you think we should talk about? And so they get to the point where if they saw the report up there, I didn't even have to ask them. While everybody's getting settled, they would look at the report and figure out, well, which ones should we talk about? Even if they got 100 on their questions, they still are analyzing the data on which ones do we need to talk about and why. And, and, it, and it's a powerful thing to get that discussion going in class. And it, it's now being led by the students and guided by you rather than you explaining to them what they did wrong. It's really powerful. Does anybody have any other questions on that? I know I just said a whole lot and I apologize for not having the, that live report working. I have no idea why that wasn't working. Okay, well, feel free to interrupt me if you have any other um, questions as we go. Um, this right here, I'm gonna drop a, a link so you can make your own copy. This is our assessments teachers routine pathway. This is a, a wonderful, um, I did not write this, somebody else did, but it's a wonderful, if you're just getting started with assessments and using data on a regular basis, it's a wonderful way to start with a routine that you're gonna use regularly with your students. And we recommend you start with a, one routine. Um, and so go ahead and click that link and you'll make your own copy in your drive. And we ask you to start with like one routine. Don't try to do everything at once learn assessments, start with one regular routine. And when you feel like your students are ready, add another routine. I'll give you a minute to look at that. Can everybody get their copy open? And while you're reading through that, consider which routine best aligns with your existing practice and why. Say that one more time. Yeah. What does the word routine pathways mean? So these are the different um, routines that will help you develop strong data routines within your class. So these pathways are different ways that you can start to develop good data routines in your class. So we recommend that you go with something that already aligns to what you're doing, that you're not completely changing what you're doing. So I'm asking you which of these routines that you're reading would best align with your existing practice and why? Because you would want to pick something that marries with something you're already doing. You don't want to start everything completely different in your class. You want to build on what you're doing. I could give you an example if you'd like. Um, a warm-up. Um, a warm-up is something we know that engage students in the prior lesson. It, it's a good way for a quick way to see if everybody is on target with where you need to go today or not. You could have one to three questions that students come and sit right down and do in the first five minutes. You can put the report up real time and say, okay, we were gonna start on this today, but first I'd like to talk about this because you see that everybody still needs a review on something or they didn't quite understand something from a day ago. Or you say, all right, great. Look at how great everybody did. I think we're ready to go on to this lesson that I had planned for today. So that would be an example of one routine using assistance as a warm up. I usually do the homework mm -hmm. uh, pathway here. Mm -hmm. um, there was, um, my, my coworker was explaining to me that illustrative math 
wants teachers to do the cool down in class with students. Mm -hmm. What have you seen that is successful? Uh, I, ha I have seen that, that to be, right. I have seen that to be successful, the cool down. Mm -hmm. um, the problem a lot of teachers run into with that is class time. And so what we have said is don't expect to do a cool down every day because sometimes it takes you two or three days to get through a lesson because I've taught with IM also. Um, but 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 use the cool down as part of the last day of the lesson and use that cool down as your launch for the next day. So you've had the cool down. You see where everybody's at. You can discuss it and go over it with them the next day and reteach or move on, depending on where they are with it. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that the biggest mistake people um, try to do with all the pieces of um, of illustrative mathematics is they try to do a lesson a day, a thing a day, a thing a day. And, it, and it's really not like that. It depends on the contents you're teaching and where you're at and who your students are. You could spend four days on a lesson in an IM. You know, when I when I taught eighth grade, I, would, I could spend 10 days on a lesson. You know, depends on what the content is. So the cool down might not be every day. And if you use homework, I would suggest that you not give them a lot of homework. I suggest you give them maybe three to five problems. Um, for homework, because that's enough of a picture. If you didn't have a cool down that day, that would be enough of a picture to know, are we ready to move on to the next part of the lesson? That would give you the same sense, even though sometimes parents help with cool downs. I, I mean, with homework, I understand that. Um, but teachers do tend to tell me they prefer cool downs in class because they want authentic data. Are there any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to talk about options for supporting students with tier one assignments. And I am talking about using assessments here, um, different ways you can use assessments to differentiate. Um, um, supporting students, as we review some of these ideas for differentiation, I want you to consider in your own thoughts, what are the biggest challenges you face when trying to address student learning gaps and be thinking about the things that I'm showing you and how could any, any, some or any of these help you in some way. Um, what is not in this, um, well, it is, it is in the next one. I disagree, it is in the next one. Um, Cause when I say uh, trying to just students learning gaps, I feel like it's excluding that group of students who um, are also needing differentiation because they have mastered what's happening in class way before everybody else. And they also need something else. And so that's also differentiation and that's not a learning gap. So it can go both ways. Um, so the first thing I, which I love is assigning to a whole group versus a subgroup. When you are in the assigned time um, screen on assessments and you pick a class, once you've picked the class, you can click this little, the menu where the class is and it will give you the list of all your students. It'll give you the whole list of them and you can click off the students and you could just assign something to a subgroup of students. So you might know that you have a couple of students who really need more practice on a particular skill that everybody else has mastered. You could go into assessments and find that skill and assign it to just those students. And maybe that's what they're doing today while everybody else is working on something else and you're supporting them in that working class. And so like I said, once again, you select your Google Classroom and then that roster is in there. If you click the down arrow, this opens up and they're all there and you can check off whichever ones you want to assign to. Um, mixing and matching. You can mix and match problems from any source in the content library to create a custom problem set that meets students' needs. Um, and I'm going to show you that in a second of how that works. Um, you can add problems from any source into a custom problem set by clicking the down arrow next to the assign button. So right here where you assign, you click instead save to my problem sets and you are actually creating your own little bundle and it'll ask you to title it and you can build on it. So you can you now have a little titled bundle you've started and maybe you've selected two problems with one kind of practice and you want a couple more problems from another kind of practice. You can go get that. And when you say save to my problem set, it'll say what problem set or do you wanna make a new one? And you can pick the one you just started to build and add to it. So you can create your own little bundles from our content. And the way you would do that is way over here, we have search by standard. And this screenshot shows it already searched. This is in the assigned screen, this little box. 
But once I searched, all these problems came up. So this is in your main screen where you are, where you are signing things over here on the menu, but this little search box is way over here. And you can search by a content by the standard, or you can actually put in just a keyword like fractions and a whole bunch of standards will come up for you. Um, and then you go down here and you, oh, you'd select which ones you want and you'd create saved my problem sets. Now, the one thing you might notice here is there's 137 problems here and two skill builders, which is another kind of content we have that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, you can filter out uh, different content, different curriculum and different styles to try and limit this list a little bit because nobody wants to look at 500 problems to pick out for a problem set. And then you'd scroll down through it and you check off the ones that you want in your, in your little bundle that you're making. Um, and Skill Builders is a, a favorite. Skill Builders is um, problem sets that target a specific standard or skill. Um, they're done by grade level, they're done by um, strand, and they're done by, they're organized by the actual standard. Um, they're, there's a, a bank around, like if you assigned this first one, there's like 150 to 200 problems in there that are randomly assigned to the student. And the student has to get three in a row, three correct in a row consecutively to get to finish the assignment. If they have 10 attempts and they don't finish the assignment, they get locked out for 24 hours so that they don't get frustrated. And it resets the next it's that in 24 hours, it like resets at midnight that night for the next school day. And that's to avoid frustration because you don't want a student sitting there trying to do something and do 50 problems. Um, this Skill Builders is wonderful for two things in my mind as a math teacher. It's great for, oh, we're getting ready for a new unit and you um, learned about these things in fifth grade. Let's do some Skill Builders to refresh our memories. And it helps me as the teacher know who maybe missed that learning and needs a little extra help. Um, it also is great when it's coming up to state testing time and you're still finishing teaching standards, but you'd like to review the things you taught way back in September, October, November. You can start assigning skill builders to students do independently. Um, I, I used to do a couple a week over the course of like eight weeks to remind them of things that we did a long time ago that maybe we're not doing right now. Um, and you do get a report that tells you if your students are not doing well. And how I would handle that is, um, how I handle that, and I'll show you the report in a minute. How I would handle that is I would say, oh, I see, I'd call a student up and say, I see you're having trouble getting that skill builder done. Why don't you come sit with me for five minutes at lunch or whenever there's a free time? I bet you're just making a small problem. We'll get right through it. And if usually if you help them with one, they understand what they were doing wrong and then they're able to, um, successfully pass it. So it really helps you to, to help everybody review while you're still teaching class. Um, the other thing we have is problem solving sets. Now, the last thing I said was skill builders. Problem solving sets are sets that you can also assign to your students to target specific standards or skills or review or for additional practice. These sets typically include five problems each and function like a regular assignment and assessments. So this is nice because it also goes through the strands and so maybe you've done all of your content practice and you like the kids to just do a little bit more practice. You can go here and find some additional practice without having to go through the process of building your own custom problem set, which obviously takes a little bit of time. These are already built for you here. And all of these things are found in our content library. I will show you that in a minute. Um, Skill Builders does have a report um, and um, you can access the skill report within your, assist, your assessments account by clicking on my assignments and navigating to the assignment and view report. Um, the report looks like this, which is a little confusing. It doesn't look like the other assignment reports because remember, this is one where they either get it right or wrong and, and or they ask for a hint, but they have to get it right to, to be complete. So you can see this student didn't get even right and got bumped out after 10. Um, this, this student only did one and quit. This student did one, got one right and quit. Um, this student got three right in a row and finished the assignment. This student got three right in a row and finished the assignment. These students got three right in a row immediately and finished the assignment. This student down here is really struggling. He got some wrong, one right. These mean they asked for hints, but once they ask for hints, it's not a correct one to get them to, to finish the assignment. Um, Barbara. So this 
Oh, yes. Can you talk about um, assessment's ability to um, handle multiple languages? I have 10 students who are just learning English. Does assessment's work in any other language? We do not, but people tell us that they use Google Translate and that it really works for them. Okay. Um, we have I not gotten to that point yet. As you may know, we're a nonprofit. And so, you know, we offer this free to everybody. And so um, that is something we would love to have someday, but right now we don't. But our teachers that are in your situation said that they use Google Translate um, for that. And that seems to be really working for them. Do you have a read aloud function where it can read the question from the skill builder set so the student is hearing the English words? We do not. We do not. And that's another thing we've worked on too for the, hear, the, um, for the seeing impaired because a read aloud would be lovely too. Okay. Um, but as I said, um, you know, we're a nonprofit. So these are all things in our, our big dream in the sky that we hope to have someday. But there are a lot of tools out there um, that read things for you and do these things for you that you probably could find for your students and install as an extension on their Chromebook or what they're using. Good question. Thank you. I'm just going to show you a closer shot of that skill builder report. There's a student who just couldn't do it, got them all wrong. This is right. Got some right, some wrong and gave up. Um, couldn't, couldn't get it at all and just went on to ask for the answer and went on. Um, it tell, once you get used to reading this, it does tell you a lot about where they are with their skills. It seems like the report's complicated, but it's not really. It's a, uh, Skill Builders is a great way, like I said, for you to get your students to do something independently, whether it's review from last year or review this of this year's content, um, something you know they probably need more practice on and you're moving on to something else. It, and it's a nice way for them to do something without you. And then you can still see what they're doing and provide help for them if they need it. Are there questions on that? Okay. The, um, can you talk about, so South Carolina is updating their standards and mm -hmm. they will begin um, for the August 2025 school year. Mm -hmm. Where is assessments in the process of revising what they're offering in their content library to match the new standards? Our content library matches the Common Core standards. So um, like in Massachusetts, some of the standards are in different grades. And so for me, I would know that how it varied from the common core standards that this was in this grade instead of that grade. And I would go look for, I would go look for that particular work in that grade. If you are um, working from a curriculum like I am, you're probably following what they did. And I don't know if you're adding on or you're excluding something. Um, remember when I said you could search by standard or by keyword. So mm -hmm. if something's not in the content library that you are teaching or not that you're looking for and you can't find, you can search that keyword and find some practice problems that way. Um, we can't match all of the standards across the country for every state because a lot of states like Massachusetts, it's like that. We ref mostly reflect the Common Core standards, but there's some things that Massachusetts has moved into different grades that in the Common Core standards are not in those grades. So you have to know that when you're looking at the content. And I think that illustrative math is working really hard to uh, change their product so that it can be ready for the new standards here. And it's really different. Mm -hmm. um, so after, you know, at the end of the meeting, I'm, I'm happy to show you what some of the things look like here. Oh, How about I'd you, love to Al, see that. The... I'd love to see that. Thank you. I've been working on content. Um, I am 360 with content changing. We have been ch updating the content to reflect their I am 360. Um, and it's it's mostly repackaging, uh, rebundling things and moving it around from what I've seen, but I'd love to hear what you have to show, show me. I'd love to see that, thank you. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do is you're gonna do your own little assignment analysis. If you do have your own report, um, we'd like you to pull it up if you already have an assignment report. If you do not, I am going to give you my link um, so that you can look at this assignment report. And I'm gonna drop it into the 
the PDF in there. I can't give you a live link because it doesn't work. Used to work, but doesn't work anymore. So that's um, a PDF view of um, this assignment report. And I'm gonna give you a few minutes to look at this report or your own report and notice what, what what do you what data do you observe? What data stands out to you? Uh, what would be an actionable next step for your instruction and why? And if you've already followed up on some report, uh, would you do something different? Or what do you wish you had done? And um, I'm going to show you where I want you to do that information in a minute. Um, this is the assignment report analysis protocol we talked about earlier. Oh, I'm not on that screen. I should show it to you. Um, that's it there. And that is also on your slides, uh, slide 36. And if you go to slide on your slides, um, slide 41 and 42, um, there's only, you can all use slide 41. I'm gonna actually go to your slide and show you. Make sure it's slide 41, it is. Um, here's where you can type. And there's the question again, considering your assignment report, what is your observation about the data? And what would be your actionable next step for instruction and why? So you could type in your observation here and then what you would do instructionally and why. And I'm just gonna give you about four minutes to do that. Five minutes, I can give you five minutes. I wanna honor your time. And feel free to unmute and ask questions if you have a question. Thank you, Sean. You will get a follow-up recording and email.
Got one more minute. Okay, in the interest of time, um, <clears throat> and I apologize, there's only two of you here now, because this obviously would be richer with more people, um, but um, somebody put that they observed um, that the graph that we discussed problems 1, E, F, and G, and maybe we teach 1A. Um, actual steps pairing students up or use of small heterogeneous groups for discussion is great to talk about how did you solve it. Students learn really well from each other when you do that. It's a, that's a great strategy. Um, when I'm looking at this report, the first thing that jumps out to me is this 30% for this problem. Although there are no reds in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, got it wrong and then correct eventually. I think that that first problem would really be a good classroom discussion about what was it that everybody struggled with and kudos to them for getting it correct eventually. Where was the misunderstanding? And let's talk about it to really solidify that learning. And it could be something as simple as a vocabulary word, the way it was phrased. Cause I know, and Denise, you know that sometimes an I am something's worded in a weird that the kids are like, what are they asking, right? You know, it could be something as simple as that or it could be they really just didn't understand something. And then when they got to that hint, then it finally made sense to them and they figured it out. So that would really warrant a nice conversation. So I don't just go for the ones where there's red. I definitely look across at these first as my protocol. Um, I do look down this way for who I'm worried about. I mean, I'm worried about this one, 15. 15. I'm worried about those ones they are extremely low unless I just started to teach this yesterday. Um, maybe those are my special ed students and I have a special ed teacher that can work with them, you know, depends on who they are. You don't know these students, so it's hard to decide what to do. But when it's your own students, you quickly know exactly what you want to do when you look at this thing because you know them and what their struggles are. Any comments or additional thoughts on this little exercise? Excellent. Um, I hope that gave you a little taste of what it is to use data in the classroom. Um, so now I'd like to wrap up and give you enough time to always do our little quick survey because that's how we improve ourselves. And so on the wrap up, I'd just like to say that we hope you um, learned in this session how to confidently find and assign the content choice and assessments and support a successful routine um, assessments routine with students. Um, the, the one thing that I did not show you that I'd like to just show you really quick is where all those things are in case you haven't seen them. Oh, the thing's always in my way. Um, all of your content is here. If you scroll down, there's your skill builders by grade level, by strand. Here's your problem solving sets by grades by strands. And then we have release state um, practice tests. These student practice assignments are when students are learning how to use assessments. These are nice if you're preparing for states. We don't have all the states here, but you can get some nice open response practice in there and talk about what makes a good open response and things of that nature. So that's also a nice prep for when you are getting ready for your state testing. Oh, and I meant to show you this also. And up at the top, 
mine has a lot of extra things in it because I have, um, uh, you don't have all these things. You only have these top three things because this is my working stuff. Up at the top, here's all your content. Here's where you search. And like I said, you can search by an actual standard or you can search by a keyword. So you could do adding, well, if I could type. And why is it not, no, match, not standard matching, sure. Get the code word, let's do fractions. I did that wrong. I don't know what's happening here. It's not working at all for me tonight. I feel like they're updating something. Oh, well, it does work by keyword. I think they're updating something. I think that's why my demo thing didn't work. So I apologize. Um, so here is our little survey. Um, you can click on the link on your last page. I can also um, attach it in here for you. And um, this is the workshop date. And this is the title that you'll put in on that survey. And that's all on your last slide. Um, I thank you for using your last minute to fill out that quick survey. Um, the feedback is we always improve everything. Did everybody find that link okay? I can copy it and put it in for you too, if that's yeah. easier. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Al, where is your school located? I'm no longer in the classroom. I'm retired. I'm here uh, because of my intellectual curiosity. How are you thinking about using this information? Well, I'm not sure that I will be using it. Uh, like I said, I'm out of the classroom. Um, I've been retired for 10 years, but I've seen technology advance.